The protests against racial injustice. Athletes across America, even high school bands and politicians, refusing to stand during the playing of the national anthem or the Pledge of Allegiance, and that's gaining momentum. It's not just athletes who are protesting in this manner, school children, politicians of course. Why has this become necessary? Joining me to discuss this are New York Assemblyman Charles Barron and attorney Colin Moore. Welcome to Brooklyn 45. Good to Thank be you here. Very much. It's good, good to be here. What response do you really expect that we'll get from these protests? Well, you know, I think that the system has co-opted this. They allow for it to happen now because in the 60s, remember when John Carlos and Tommy Smith raised their clenched fist to the American flag at the Olympics, they got punished. They got punished. As a matter of fact, they couldn't get jobs. And also, John Collis's wife unfortunately committed suicide. Now, the system is allowed. I'm glad it's happening. I hope more people do it. It's the right thing to do. But the system is tolerating it now. Uh, Colin Kaepernick is making $100 million and guaranteed $60 million, even if his sponsors uh, cut him off. Uh, he's not going to be punished. I'm glad he's doing it. But he's not going to be punished. But they need to take the other step that Colin is taking. He's putting a million dollars. He's putting his money where his mouth is. And he's putting a million dollars into organizations like Black Lives Matter and other that are going to fight against police brutality. But the bottom line, Sam, is America needs a revolution. When Betsy Ross was stitching the American flag, we were catching wounds that needed stitches in slavery. When Francis Scott Key, was penning the Star-Spangled Banner, enslaved Africans liberated themselves and fought with the British Royal Navy against America when they were both in the War of 1812 trying to uh, take over Canada. Francis Scott Key was a racist. Francis Scott Key had fought against the abolition of, of slavery. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when you have, and then matter of fact, he left out the third stanza of the Star Spangled Matter that speaks to slaves that he said should be in their grave because they took flight and left slavery to fight on the British side. So go ahead, y'all. Protest against this national anthem. Sit down. I've been sitting down ever since I was a teenager, and I've done it for 12 years in the city council, and I don't stand up in the state assembly. But after that, after you get on your knee... After what you sit in your seat, that? then get your behind up and get involved in this movement on a regular basis and not waiting for somebody to kill us. Because police brutality, we have to protest against it, but it is a distraction. Because if they never kill another one of us again, poverty is killing us more because we live under a racist capitalist system. Colin. The beautiful thing about what is happening now is the universalization of the struggle. It's no longer confined, say, to the civil rights leader or the elected officials. It is extended to the celebrities, to the athletes, to the children, to uh, individuals all over the spectrum. And that's the beautiful thing. They can no longer just target a Martin Luther King or a particular leader, you know, because the struggle has moved beyond that. We have athletes who command tremendous um, salaries and so forth. We have school children. We have thousands of people, you know, all over the United States now. So you can no longer kill, you, can, you might be able to kill the leader, but you cannot kill the idea. The idea has spread and it has become universal now. One of the things I want you to discuss are the constitutional, um, what, what does the constitution permit? And uh, what is there in the Constitution to protect the, these persons who are protesting or to prevent them pro to, from protesting? But I'm going to get back to you in a minute about that one. Um, but Charles, should, should the restriction only be to those persons who are protesting right now? And I know you say you've been protesting for a long time, mm -hmm. but we don't as yet see many elected officials doing so. That's the least the elected officials can do is this. This is easy, Sam. There's no consequences that you even have to pay for it. That's the very least that an elected official can do. And not just for like they may do in this council, city council for one session. Uh, my wife, Inez Barron, is not pledging anymore. 
but we have to do the least things is that. I think Colin is correct. It's now being spread. Mm -hmm. But see, we got to look out for co-optation when the system can allow you to do certain things. See, they wise. They knew when they punished us and attacked us in the 60s, it made them look bad. Now, they allow you to do that. They'll even allow you be, to be a socialist and run for president, yeah. <laughs> knowing that you're going to, as long as your socialism stays in bounds. Mm -hmm. You're not talking about nationalizing industries. You're not talking about changing the system, but you're talking about taxing the rich or breaking up the banks. And they know Bernie Sanders was going to bring all of that back to Hillary Clinton. So as long as you stay in bounds, they're going to tolerate mm -hmm. more of that. We got to get out of bounds. What I find very interesting is when Jumani Williams decided he was going to sit down, the hate mail, that hate mail he received, some people called him plantation monkey. Mm. Some people said, we hope we, you have an accident and you're not going to be able to even sit down or right. stand. Well, you know, those are the Donald Trump type of people that's in this nation. We, I, if I show you the tons of hate mail, I don't even bring it to the public. I have so much hate mail. That's irrelevant. The only relevancy is mm. after we sit down, what are we going to stand up and do? After we don't respect the Star Spangled Manor anymore, which is a good thing, what are we going to do in between the police killings to get some power, to make people pay consequences for the things that they do to us, and to unite our people to do for ourselves what the system won't do for us, and then demand that the system give us our fair share? This is a revolutionary struggle, and it can't be symbolic acts alone. Mm -hmm. What are some of the constitutional issues surrounding all this, Colin? Okay. The, the particular right that is implicated here is the First Amendment to the Constitution. The Explain first, that. The First Amendment says Congress shall pass no laws abridging, abridging mm -hmm. the freedom of speech yes. or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, assemble. Yes. You know, and to petition for their rights. Okay. So um, the reason why is the First Amendment is because the leaders of this country, the individuals who fought... Um, the, for for the uh, independence of America, mm -hmm. recognized that one of the most fundamental rights that they had against the British was the right to express themselves, mm -hmm. you know, and to criticize the sovereign power, and so therefore they enshrined that as the first, the first and most um, relevant right mm -hmm. in the Constitution. Mr. Barron, mm -hmm. what kind of changes? Do you really think will come out of all this? Well, I think unless there's some serious work after you get up off your knees and or out after you stand up off your seat, I think this raises some consciousness as a teaching moment, and we should take advantage of that. It'll be able to do the, what are you going to tell your children? Should they salute? Should they stand up? Should they pledge? And we should tell schools that they shouldn't mandate patriotism. You have to earn our patriotism, and you have not done that. So this is not the land of the free and the home of the brave, freedom and justice for all. That's a lie, so we can't teach our children to lie. What I'm hoping comes out of this is that after people get up and after they do this protest, that they join organizations for the protracted struggle for power in our communities, that we got to say to black elected officials that we don't need any more neo-colonial puppets, no more selling out. I hope that these new millennial will get up and they'll rise up and they'll take some of these seats of power from those who want to go along to get along to make the effective changes that we need here. Our people are dying 200 years ago. America was colonized by England, mm -hmm. and they said, give me liberty or give me death. Well, 200 years later, America is in a domestic colonistic way colonizing black people. And we say freedom or death, revolution now, just like America said when they were colonized by the British. Mm -hmm. And it's important to realize that the message that is being transmitted here by the protesters is that if you do not respect our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, we will not respect the symbols of your national power, such as your That's flag, right. That's right. your national anthem, and your oath of allegiance. That's but, right. But haven't blacks been saying that for a long while? Haven't blacks been asking for reparations for a long while? N nothing has happened. 
Well, mm -hmm. something has happened. The public is more conscious of it. Well, they did a mm -hmm. they did a uh, survey and they found out that more of the young, newer generation are more susceptible and our knowledge of reparations. So you first got to educate before you can act and really get anything. And you're either going to get it through litigation legislation or in the streets but it's going to happen there are a lot of things take time and you never know who would have thought that now everybody's not pledge allegiance i mean i saw a whole football team and the coaches mm -hmm. took a knee now who would have thought that that would happen so you never know when time it is and when something's going to take off just like black power took off people said black power before stokely carmichael people sat down on the pledge allegiance before colin did but it's the time, the zeitgeist. And not this calling. Not this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And yes. the important thing is the other day, um, Hillary Clinton said uh, one of the problems they're, f they're facing is implicit racism. Implicit racism. In other words, for a white person, a white candidate for political office, to, um, to concede that whites have a problem with racism, even if it's not direct or expressed, it, it comes basically from the Interesting that she did say that. That she admitted that. Well, hey, y'all, don't give her too much and credit for saying no, that because no, her good. policies mm. was diametrically mm. opposed to everything she uttered. That's a, 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 a lady trying to get elected. Mm. But the reality is all of her policies was diametrically opposed mm -hmm. to what are your three strikes you end for life, mass mm. incarceration. Mm. Ended affirmative action as we knew it, ended mm. welfare as we knew it. So don't mm. give us no rhetoric at election time. Now, I don't mm. give her no credit for that. We got yeah. twiddly D and twiddly dumb. There is no win in this one. A neo-fascist idiot, Trump, and a neo-conservative who hurt us in the past, Clinton. Yeah, but the point that I'm making is not that uh, it's any progress, but the very fact that she can concede the existence of this thing. It, it's an important But her concession step. is political opportunism. Mm. It's not sincere. And we've got, but we've got to make sure that her feet are held to the fire. That's our obligation. If she, be, if she is elected. If she's elected. This new National mm -hmm. Museum of National History that was just opened, mm -hmm. and uh, that's gaining a lot of attention. What, what is the statement about that? And uh, how does that help uh, whites understand uh, our history, our history of slavery? Um, what, what, is, what is your position on that? Well, I saw some of this stuff, and it's not for whites to understand, because I really don't care whether they understand us or not. It's for us to understand that we don't only have a history of slavery. We had a history before slavery. So I'm hoping that that museum, that you show the glorious empires of Africa mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. how we didn't start, our history doesn't start in slavery. It doesn't start where the boats dropped us off. It start where the boats picked up, up from in Africa. Secondly, we have a history of resistance, of revolutions, of resistance. That should be prominent in there, not just slavery. I'm tired of roots. I'm tired of them always starting us off in slavery and show us in a, a, sub, a subjugated, dominant role. Show that we resisted. I have a whole list of resistance. Have they ever heard of Casper Yanga? He resisted in Mexico and was never captured again. Nanny of the Maroons. Of course, you know Nat Turner and Harriet Tubman, but there's a glorious history of the system right here in mm. New York City. In 1712, enslaved Africans rose up and burnt things up, and then by 1827, they abolished slavery. So let's yeah. talk about resistance and revolution, not just slavery. The child is absolutely correct. And the thing about it, the message should be not to educate white people as to what happened, but to educate our people as to the glorious history we've had. I don't even like to use the word slaves because we were not slaves. Slaves is just a... A, right. a legalistic phrase. That's we right. were an enslaved people. We were a great civilization. That's right. As Charles says, going back to the whole um, Mali, Songhai, That's Ghana right. empires Empire. and whatnot. This About 30% of blacks are under the age of 18. Mm. What message do we take wow. to them? Wow. See, that's a powerful, powerful question because we got to let them know that we are an African people. We didn't start in slavery, that we can and will win, that we must unite, that you come out of the people who that are the first. That you must unite. We must unite. We're the first people on the planet. We built the, taught the world mathematics, science, astrology, astronomy, and now enslavement 
put us in the condition we're in. But young people, you have to rise up and realize that there is no force on earth that is invincible. No part of our oppression is permanent. It's temporary. Who would have thought mm -hmm. that, you know, and I disagree with a lot of his policies. I think he did some really horrible things domestically and abroad Who's for that? capitalism, Barack Obama. But who would have thought that there would have been one in that position? So all mm -hmm. things are possible. Mm -hmm. I think that we can't go let them put a black face on white racism and fool us to make us think that's progress. We got to get some authentic. Some of us are descriptively black. Mm -hmm. They look like us. We need authentically black people that are committed to us. I know you've been watching the media. How do you think the media is handling these protests? Well, I think the media has been really putting a lot. They try to find spokespersons. So what they'll do is they'll go to a place like Ferguson. And the real brothers and sisters who made it happen, they move the cameras away from them and they find acceptable voices. They'll go to Milwaukee, they go to Baltimore, and they find the comfortable voices, and they put them on CNN, and put them on MSNBC, and the authentic voices, some of the more radical, militant voices in those period, places, they don't get a play, just the comfortable ones. And the thing about it to the media too, they just look for action, for physical action. They're not interested in interpreting what is happening in the movement. It's ratings. And very, uh, yeah, it's and, ratings. And as soon as the particular event concludes, they take their cameras away and they go someplace else. Our story is not continuing. I know we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. I know that more people will probably be joining the protests. Um, what do you think the next step will be? And I know you did say that there must be there must be support of the movement to ensure yes, yes. that there is racial Sam, equality. Sam, we have to go beyond waiting for somebody to kill us before we act. In between these killings, and we got to act on the killings, no question, I think we need to look at local politics, take over the power seats like city council, assembly, district leaders, and the local communities with black, radical, conscious blacks, not the democratic black leaders that go along to get along. That's what we did in East New York with Operation Power. That's what I think needs to happen across the country, because change is going to come from the bottom up, not the top down. We've got one minute left. Colin, um, I'm giving you half of that minute, and then yeah. Assemblyman Barber will give me half of that other minute. Charles, I'm going to be knocking at your door, because I mean, I have gotten telephone calls from individuals. They want to know, why don't we start a Black Lives um, movement in Brooklyn, in the borough of Brooklyn here, right at Medgar Evers, you know? And um, so I would like to engage mm -hmm. with the elected officials like Charles, who have taken the banner, you know, carried it. Well, in my and, 30 seconds. And the, <laughs> and, the, and, and the students and whatnot at Medgar Evers. Colin, and in all, all due respect, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be sitting waiting for you to knock on my door to mm -hmm. start a Black Lives Matter movement. Mm -hmm. We already started our Operation Power movement mm -hmm. in East New York. We got the city council seat, the assembly seat. We have the board president of CB5, the district manager. We have black radicals who took over East New York local politics. So don't knock on okay. my door. Knock on some of them politicians <laughs> who have nothing <laughs> to do. <laughs> the continuing <laughs> pro <laughs> protest against racial violence. Against, and I say violence, I know people refer to it as racial injustice, but Correct. it's also violence. It is. It is <laughs> um, definitely violence. Thank you very much, Assemblyman Barron, thank for you, Sam. being my guest on Brooklyn 45. Thank you very much, Colin Moore. Thank you. And uh, we are going to move on to Kellen Esperance, who has a word for us on happiness and uh, inequality. And then we'll be talking to Fred Nurse about his new books. Did you know that black people are considered to be the most optimistic about the future compared to other racial groups in America? Some may ask, how could this be with all the racism and obstacles they face? Well, Cal Grams, a woman who studies happiness and inequality from Brookings Institution, analyzed data that reflected the feelings of poor groups in America. When asked to predict their lives within the next five years, black people had the highest likelihood of feeling optimistic about their future. One factor in their optimism is they tend to compare their well-being to previous generations in the black community instead of comparing themselves to whites in other groups. 
Because of the era we currently live in, blacks believe they have a better chance at accomplishing their dreams, unlike some of their parents, grandparents, and ancestors. Other racial groups show signs of insecurity and pessimism, facing tough competition in the workforce and failing to believe they'll live as well as their parents. While others seem to be giving up on the American dream, we continue to embrace it. Back to you, Sam. Thank you, Kevin. Fred Nurse is the author of several books about love, how to find true love, coping with separation and divorce. These are just some of them. Welcome to Brooklyn 45. Thank you, Professor Tate, for Why the invitation. Why do you choose to write about love? <laughs> I chose to write books about love because love is such a, oh gosh, a, a tender subject that is often not understood or appreciated. When we look at the, 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 the quantity of marriages that are falling apart, I decided that maybe I should take some of my experiences and put them on pr in print so that it would be beneficial to the large community and some way uh, reduce the quantity of marriages that are falling apart. But your marriage never fell apart. Well, I've been married altogether for 45 years. Mm -hmm. This is my second time at it. Okay. <laughs> you know, I was married. Because I met your beautiful wife. Oh, yes, yes, yes. She's <laughs> yeah. lovely indeed. And thank you so much, sir. Uh, the first time I was married, uh, was married for 24 years. I thought I had it all together. However, you know, marriage fatigue um, and, uh, you know, losing the joy and the spontaneity of the marriage began to decline. And I looked up one day and all of a sudden I found myself at the divorce court. Uh, it was not a pleasant experience, but the experience taught me a lot. It taught me, you know, some of the things that I perhaps was missing in the relationship, things I had taken for granted, things that were obvious and before my face that I, that I just overlooked. So in writing my books, I thought that I would try to embody some of those experiences, some of the feelings, the hurts, the joy, the laughter, and some of the disappointment in my writing. How do you cope with separation and divorce? That's the title of one of these. How mm. do you cope with it? Hmm. Coping with separation and divorce is not an easy subject. As a matter of fact, it's a very painful matter. But, you know, as we try to cope with separation and divorce, particularly, you know, separa uh, separation is a time of reflection to make a bad or a good decision in terms of going ahead or going separately. Um, it's a time in which is, is, it, 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 it is self-reflection. Questions need to be asked of oneself. Why did it happen? What were the things that caused the, the, you know, the, the marriage to come apart? And how can I now put my life back together again? So, you know, I went through a lot of painful experiences during that time of, of, of separation and divorce. And this other topic, uh, this is really interesting. Yes. How do you know it's love? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. yes. How, do, how do you know it's love? And that's really my premier book. I love uh, that book. Uh, having, I had a lot of fun in writing the book. Um, what we begin to look at in the book are values. Oftentimes, we don't take into account the values. And there are two real, real, real value systems that I identify in the book. One is the you know, characteristics. Characteristics might be how we comb my hair, how we talk, how we walk, and things like that. But the core values, core values usually fall in three separate categories. It is our core value of family, community, and our faith. These are the things that we'll go to bat for. These are the things that we'll fight for. And if, in fact, that's crossed, then in the family structure, we have a combative situation. And I talk in the book how to deal with these things, how to overcome some of these problems. And perhaps the largest part is understanding one of those expectations. Mm -hmm. When you enter in a relationship, what are your expectations of me? What should I expect from you? And how can we marry those two things together? knowing that both of us are coming in a new relationship with baggage, sometimes heavy baggage. And the baggage, you know, you know is all over the gamut. The baggage could be an ailing parent, and the, other, and the new spouse don't want to deal with it, you know, that, 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 that ailing parent, or that autistic child, or the pet. But it's all part of the baggage. And the ability of your partner to, to, yes. to deal with all that. Yes. 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 How do you know it's really love? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how to find love in ah, seven easy, easy steps. steps. Yes, 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 yes. You know, the Bible is such a rich uh, uh, organism. 
And I'm calling it an organism because it's still alive. It still could continue to feed into us daily. You know, the words of, you know, uh, 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 of the old sages, you know, if you will, all right, uh, is, is uh, much alive today as it was then. You know, whether it be Proverbs, whether it be the book of Psalms. And in this book, How to Find True Love and Seven Easy Steps, you know, person, people laugh at me and say, hey, come on, friend, what are you talking about? Well, you know, uh, you know, they may be, you know, here's one quote that I got, you know, from the uh, from first Peter of all places in the Bible, in the New Testament. They may be one without a word by your conduct. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning or be external, the braiding of hair and the putting of gold jewelry or the clothing that you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. We've got to read this book, <laughs> How to Find Love in Seven Easy Steps. Uh, this other one is Coping with Separation and Divorce, and this is How Do You Know It's, it's love. love. Yes. Fred, where can people get these books? Okay, the books are available on Amazon.com and can be ordered there. Um, as well as, and I'll put my, 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 my number out there because, you know, my home number, I'm sorry. We, we put the number, so okay. just tell us what it is. Okay, the cell phone number is 917-456-7965. And the books are written specifically uh, for churches that want to establish and maintain a marriage ministry. That's the guide. Okay, thank you. Fred Nurse, author. I love these titles. Thank you, sir. And uh, you should all go down to Amazon and you'll be able to get copies of these books. This is Brooklyn 45. I've been pleased to have Fred Nurse as my guest and uh, make sure that you tell other people about Brooklyn 45. I'm Sam Tate.